One of the questions considered by both of these courts was, what did President Obama mean when he said this? And when this exchange is up and running, millions of people will get tax breaks to help them afford coverage, which represents the largest middle-class tax cut for health care in history. That's what this reform's about. The courts also had to decide, what did Senate Finance Committee Chairman Max Baucus mean when he said this? Americans be able to count on the health care coverage that they buy. And tax credits will help to ensure that all Americans can afford quality health insurance. Two federal appeals courts considered those statements, those exact statements in two challenges brought against the federal subsidies in the Affordable Care Act. Both cases were brought by residents of states who opted, the states opted not to create states, state health insurance exchanges because the health care law mandates that everyone buy insurance, residents of the states without state health insurance exchanges have to buy it through a federally established insurance exchange or then be subject to the penalties in the Affordable Care Act. In both cases, the plaintiffs claimed that without subsidies, their income would exempt them from the individual mandate and the penalty. And they claimed that Congress only intended subsidies for insurance purchased on the state exchanges, not insurance purchased on the federal exchange. In a two-to-one decision, the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals agreed with the plaintiffs. The tax credit is available only to subsidize the purchase of insurance on an exchange established by the state. A federal exchange is not an exchange established by the state. And the bill does not authorize the IRS to provide tax credits for insurance purchased on the federal exchanges. But the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals in Virginia, facing the same questions, unanimously agreed that regardless of what Congress actually wrote in one particular line of the legislation, lawmakers clearly intended for people in every state to be eligible for the subsidies. With only 16 state-run exchanges currently in place, the economic framework supporting the act would crumble if the credits were unavailable on federal exchanges. Furthermore, without an exception to the individual mandate, millions more Americans unable to purchase insurance without the credits would be forced to pay a penalty that Congress never envisioned imposing on them. The IRS rule avoids both these unforeseen and undesirable consequences and thereby advances the true purpose and means of the act. Today, the White House answered the question of the health care law's intent. The law was designed to make health care affordable through tax credits, and it is working. Joining me now are Julian Epstein, former counsel for the House Judiciary Committee and former counsel for uh, House, and E.J. Dion, columnist for the Washington Post. Uh, Julian, we need the lawyers here. Uh, they found a sentence. They found one line in this these 1,500 pages where they could try to lynch linchpin this decision, saying that oh yeah, clearly uh, there was no intent here for subsidies through the federal exchanges. There is one provision, essentially one provision in the entire statute where the eligibility of federal exchanges for tax subsidies is implicit. Mm -hmm. There are at least six provisions elsewhere in the provision where the eligibility of federal exchanges is rather explicit. The CBO scoring contemplates that the federal exchanges will be eligible for tax subsidies. The federal calculation of an individual's tax liability uh, at every uh, April 15th is predicated on the idea that some of them are going to be getting tax uh, uh, subsidies under the federal exchanges. Uh, the uh, 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 the uh, uh, entire premise of the statute is the central portion of the community rating and the guarantee provisions are all premised on the idea that everybody participates, uh, including if you have to go through the federal system. There is a central provision that everybody under, that everybody learns in law school is called the Chevron principle. If a agency has got to interpret a congressional statute and there's something ambiguous or there are provisions that are conflicting, the federal agency under the Chevron principle basically can 
but can make the determination, uh, and that's what the Fourth Circuit said. The Eleventh, uh, the the D.C. Circuit, when it comes up for a what's called an en banc review, the entire circuit court, they're almost assuredly going to go the same way as the Fourth Circuit. The bottom line here is, I don't think the circuits will be in conflict on this. I think the courts, the circuit courts, will uphold this, and I don't think this so will ever get to the Supreme Court. Procedurally, this was uh, uh, the D.C. decision was a decision of three judges in the D.C. appeals courts, and what that means, it now goes to the full appeals court and your prediction on the full appeals court. It's seven Democratic appointed judges, four Republican appointed judges. I think uh, it is almost certain that the law will be upheld there, in which case there will not be a conflict between the Fourth Circuit and the D.C. Circuit. I don't think the Supreme Court, will, I think the Supreme Court will decline to take this, one, because there's no conflict, two, because the Supreme Court doesn't want to take this case. I don't think they want this case because it's a no-win situation for them. If they are to uh, invalidate the law, um, they would do incredible harm to the court, which was a central thing that Justice Roberts was concerned about in the ACA in the main case. Uh, I think there are years and years of uh, decisions that Justice Scalia and Alito and others have uh, have. Uh, signed their names to that basically endorse the Chevron principle, which is you defer to the agencies if there's some kind of ambiguity in the congressional statute, as there is here, but I don't even think there is that much ambiguity. E e Just by the way, it doesn't so go automatically. They've got to agree to go on bonk. And the, the D.C. Circuit is often reluctant to overturn uh, one of the panels, but in this case, this is so important and I think so outrageous on its face that mm -hmm. they will want to take it and overturn it. Even if you were to accept the conservative view of this, that it's ambiguous, it's a close call. The, the time-honored principle that Justice, again, the conservatives on the Supreme Court have all signed their names to is that the federal agencies have the ability under the Chevron principle to make that determination. So the reason that the Supreme Court doesn't take it is not just because the politics are bad for them, not because not, not just because if they take it and they were to uh, invalidate the law, uh, they are going to take five to seven million Americans off their health insurance. They're going to deny tax cuts for five to seven low-income Americans. They're going to mm -hmm. raise these premiums for five to seven. It, some estimates say that six million people could lose their health insurance as a result of it. Those politics are bad. The jurisprudential politics are bad because it totally contradicts their previous positions. So they don't want to have to deal with that question versus uh, placating the conservatives. So this, I don't think the Supreme Court's going to take this case. I think this is going to be over by uh, fall. EJ, quickly, the last word on this. Um, if you wonder which side of politics judicial activism is on, <laughs> it ain't on the side of the liberals anymore. That is the perfect last word. Julian Epstein and E.J. Dion, thank you both.